ROM hacks, they're typically associated with fan-edited versions of older games. For those unaware, ROM hacks are game files that are modified to change up the game either mechanically or visually. While ROM hacks are typically associated with fan mods and other wares, not all ROM hacks are unofficial. In fact, some of them were created by the actual developer or publisher to better market the game in other territories, or because they lost the licensing rights, or for varying other reasons. Everybody and their grandma knows that Super Mario Bros. 2 for the NES is actually just a reskinned ROM hack of Doki Doki Panic for the Famicom Disk System. But what if I told you there were a bunch of other officially licensed ROM hacks out in the wild? Hi, I'm Frank, and in today's Frank's 5, we'll be discussing 5 officially licensed ROM hacks for retro Nintendo hardware. For this list, I will only be including games that were altered in an official capacity, so fan hacks and improvements won't be included. Before we get into this video, make sure to smash that subscribe button and hit the notification bell to stay up to date on future Frank uploads. Number 5 an often overlooked franchise, Bomberman has been around for several decades now. The White Bomber debuted on various home computer systems in 1983 and has since exploded onto just about every platform you can think of. The NES had Bomberman, the Super NES had the Super Bomberman series, and the Game Boy had the Bomberman GB series. Now if you're like me and you're from the States, or you're from Europe, then you're probably thinking, but Frank, we only got one Bomberman GB game. False. The game we Northerners know as Bomberman GB was actually the sequel to the Japanese game of the same name. So now you may think that means that we never got the original Bomberman GB, that this game is locked to Japan as a regional exclusive. Nope. In what was an incredibly weird partnership, especially considering that this was the mid-90s, Hudson Soft and Nintendo collaborated on a Mario crossover. But Mario bombing Bomberman? I mean, there was the Game & Watch title Mario's Bombs Away, but Mario attacking this little robot seems a little out of character. So what kind of collaboration did they have in store? Well, a reskin of the original Bomberman GB, but replacing our titular bomber person with Wario. Honestly, Wario Blast just kind of makes sense. Wario was just coming off the launch of Wario Land, Super Mario Land 3, which had released prior that same year. And honestly, slapping Wario into the game really gives it a lot more personality than the Japanese original release. Fun fact, this game helped solidify Wario's association with bombs, which would continue to represent the character even to this day. Wario Blast was actually my first exposure to the Bomberman series as a kid. Had it not been for Wario's inclusion, this game likely would have slipped right past my radar. In my opinion, Wario Blast is the superior version. The Japanese original just comes off as a little bit generic. Number four. The 90s were a great time to be alive. It was the golden era of cartoons, it was the decade that brought us many historically monumental video games, and it was the time of TV mascots. It seems like every company had to have some sort of cartoon mascot to flaunt around and attract the kiddos. One horrendous memory from my childhood is that weird human rabbit monstrosity better known as the Noid. Domino's Pizza used this ugly bastard in all of their commercials and adverts from 1986 all the way up to the 90s. As nightmare-inducing as the Noid is, at least he brought personality to the Domino's brand. Now? What the f*** is this? In 1990, Capcom published the infamous NES platformer, Yo Noid. This odd partnership with Domino sees their mascot traveling around the Big Apple on a quest to stop Mr. Green, some dude who let loose a bunch of animals in the streets of New York. Somebody probably should have just called PETA or something. Everything about this game just comes across as, I don't know, misplaced? There's a reason for that, though. The game was initially developed as Masked Ninja Hanamaru, which is how it released in Japan. The weird thing about this one is that both Yo Noid and Masked Ninja released on the same day, March 16th, 1990. This game was surely developed with an initial plan, but which one's a ROM hack of which? Yeah, it's pretty obvious. The neat thing about these games is that while they share the same gameplay and level layout, and I do mean the same, I mean look at them. The visuals had a massive overhaul, and the storyline was obviously altered. All of Hanamaru's ninja weaponry have been completely reskinned in Yonoid. The Noid was given much more cartoony attacks, which I actually dig. In Masked Ninja, our protagonist is off on an altruistic adventure to save abducted children. But in Yonoid, yeah, he's just in it for the pizza. That's right, the mayor bribes the Noid to stop Mr. Green's minions of animals and Noid clones in exchange for some Domino's pizza. This ain't no prize. I'm going to be completely honest here. At the end of the day, Mass Ninja is just your typical run-of-the-mill NES platformer. It's incredibly linear and difficult as all hell, but doesn't really stand out as anything revolutionary. The choice to rebrand the game as Yo Noid for US and PAL territories was a great call by the localization team. I bet in 1990 the general public just saw it as a shady deal to advertise the Domino's brand, and maybe they were right. But now, Yo Noid goes down in infamy as a game that probably shouldn't exist, but does anyway. 
The game would come out shortly after some tragic events, which would result in the Noid being ultimately canned for a couple of decades, only to return in 2011. I guess there's just no avoiding the Noid. Number 3! Violence in video games has always seemed to be a hot topic. While in the United States, games depicting blood and gore, like Mortal Kombat, were a cause for controversy. However, titles like Contra were totally acceptable. This NES classic that was many gamers' first exposure to the well-known Konami code spawned a full-fledged series that even saw a release as recent as 2019. While Contra released unaltered in the United States and Japan, PAL regions received something different. Probotector. Probotector is essentially just Contra, but sees protagonists Bill and Lance, along with all enemies, replaced with robots. While never officially confirmed, it can be assumed that this was due to Germans' strict regulations at the time, which banned the sale of video games too violent for children. Since Contra saw humans at war, which would directly go against German law, replacing all living people with Probotectors was a simple fix. The actual visual changes from Contra to Probotector aren't that drastic, but Konami's intentions to tone down the violence factor to avoid controversies were definitely made apparent. See? This is much less violent. Ow. 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 The Probotector reskins would continue to release over in Europe, all the way up throughout the fourth generation of consoles. This means Super C, Contra 3, Operation C, and Hard Corps would all be modified to feature robot-on-robot -robot action. It wouldn't be until the fifth generation of consoles that would finally allow those in Europe to experience Contra the way it was intended. But that said, Probotector is still an integral part of the series. Had it not been for Germany's strict guidelines, Probotector characters would have never materialized. Konami would later introduce the Probotectors to other territories as a secret unlockable character in Contra 4 for the Nintendo DS. This would substantiate them as a canon part of Contra lore, explaining that these robots fought alongside Bill and Lance during their initial outings. Neat. Number two! You know what goes together about as well as peanut butter and sardines? Education in video games. Stinkers like Bible Adventures, Donkey Kong Jr. Math, Mario Teaches Typing, all tricked kids into learning through mediocre gameplay. Trust me, I know firsthand. There were some decent ones though, like Oregon Trail, Rayman Brain Games, Brain Age, but some of them were just incredibly questionable to say the least. Welcome Wisdom Tree, the company responsible for many unlicensed Christian-themed video games. They would begin releasing games in 1991 with the infamous Bible Adventures, and would continue developing and publishing games up to 2007 with Jesus in Space. Wow. In 1994, Wisdom Tree released the unlicensed Super NES Splendor Super 3D Noah's Ark, the old school first person shooter featuring Noah on his Ark. Yeah, leave it to Wisdom Tree to turn Christianity into an FPS. Immediately seeing any gameplay, it's apparent what title Wisdom Tree reskinned. Microsoft id Software's Wolfenstein 3D. Wisdom Tree did actually acquire the proper licensing to use the Wolfenstein 3D game engine, but their plans were initially to create a movie tie-in game with the 1987 horror film Hellraiser. Yeah, that's right, the company known for creating kid-friendly Christian games wanted to make a gory first-person shooter based on a gruesome horror flick. Needless to say, that didn't happen, but whatever scraps of the project they had been working on got repurposed into Super 3D Noah's Ark, a game notorious for its lack of violence. See, Noah's not hurting the animals, he's flinging drug-induced food at them that causes them to fall asleep. I'm not sure what the hell Wisdom Tree was thinking with this one, but it's actually kind of great. In 2014, the game was revamped in a different, more modern engine, and re-released onto Steam. Because of this, Super 3D Noah's Ark is easily Wisdom Tree's most accessible game, and for good reason. It's not bad. Wolfenstein 3D, good game. Super 3D Noah's Ark, an official ROM hack of a good game. By default, it's good, right? Eh, that's up for debate. But it's definitely a memorable game to say the least. Number one! Regional reskins seemed to be commonplace during the 90s. This seems especially so with games pertaining to a specific license. Naturally, it makes sense to try to target specific demographics with IPs that will be popular in said regions. Introducing Mickey Mouse 4 Maho no Labyrinth, a game that would predate and inspire the critically acclaimed Mickey's Castle of Illusion, it released exclusively to Japan in 1993 and would be the fourth of a five-game Mickey Mouse series. When it came time to release the game in other territories, though, developer Kemco went a little overboard with the licenses. Europe saw Mickey Mouse get swallowed up by Garfield, the lovable fat cat who hates Mondays and loves to domestically abuse his owner. The gameplay in Garfield Labyrinth is virtually the exact same as Mickey Mouse 4, but with some reskinned sprites. 
Now don't get me wrong, I loved Garfield growing up, but is he really more popular than Mickey Mouse in PAL regions? I mean, I like him more, but this isn't about me. I live in the States. Speaking of, North America didn't receive a Mickey Mouse game or a Garfield game. So what did we get? Heathcliff? Snoopy? The Smurfs? Nope. Kemco decided to reskin the game, yet again, as to tie in with the real Ghostbusters cartoon series, which had ended its run two years prior to this game's release. That just makes no sense to me. I mean, Peter's f***ing proton gun doesn't even work on the ghosts. It only affects the ground. What gives? This is definitely one of, if not the, strangest entries on this list. I still don't understand why Kemco didn't just stick with Mickey Mouse for all three releases. Haha, <laughs> why the f*** was I replaced by two properties I don't own? Yet. <laughs> to make matters more confusing than the Multiverse of Madness, all of these games are iterations of Kemco's Crazy Castle series, which those in North America will know as Bugs Bunny Crazy Castle. The history of this franchise is incredibly fascinating and convoluted, but could be a video all of its own. If you'd like me to make that video, let me know in the comments section. Hey, thanks for making it this far. If you liked what you saw, please leave a like and a comment. Also, make sure to subscribe to the channel for future gaming goodness. Till next time, peace.